Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Nishe from NisheSnow.com. That's N-A-C-H-E-S-N-O-W.com. Welcome to another episode. I've got Jennifer Lynn on today, who is an illustrator and author, and her story is amazing. Just a couple things. Remember, you can use the code FREESHIP, F-R-E-E-S-H-I-P, over at nishaysnow.com slash journal to get free shipping on the journal. Also, if you haven't already, please head on over to iTunes and give me a five-star rating or Stitcher, and if you're listening on YouTube, a thumbs up and a comment would be amazing, and as I've mentioned before, that really helps people discover the show, even sharing the episodes with other people who you think uh, will resonate with the content really, really, really helps me out, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who has already done that. I really appreciate it. Um, Even recently, I've talked to some folks who've shared my information with other people, be it the journal, the podcast, or whatever, and I just cannot tell you how much that means to me. So I just really want to give you just a shout out on here to say thank you, because this is a labor of love. Okay, so on to the show, Jennifer Lynn. So I discovered her in a Facebook group that we're both a part of. And if you know, as a podcaster, you just have to like stalk people all the time (laughs) because you're always looking for guests. And I saw her, I forgot what she had posted about, but then I went over to her website and I was like, oh, I need to have her on the podcast. So anyway, She has been a creative entrepreneur since a young age. She now um, lives off of her income that is generated from being an illustrator. And we talk about how she's diversified her income and evolved over time. And some of that evolution has been to actually become an author. And so we talk about her first book, you know, self-publishing it and also going through Kickstarter. And then we also talk about how her next book, which is coming out next year, she actually got picked up by a publisher. So I just thought her story was really inspirational. It just shows you like how hard work, dedication, and pushing through difficult times uh, can really help you achieve the life that you want. So I hope you guys also find this to be inspirational. Here we go. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome Jennifer on to the podcast. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello. Yeah, I'm so glad I discovered you in the Facebook group, so I can't wait to dig into your story. But before we even get into how you became this amazing artist, can you just tell the listeners just a little bit about your background? My name is Jennifer, and I am an illustrator and an author and a podcast host as well. I actually, I started doing artist related things when I was really young, around nine, I started making jewelry and I started selling it at 15 and did that for 10 years. And then in 2010, while going through a really difficult time, I found illustration and that kind of helped me out of the difficult time. Um, And so I've been doing that ever since. Neat. So question for you. Have you ever had like a nine to five job or um, did you just kind of start out as like an entrepreneur? So I was raised in a family where you work for yourself, Mm. but I've had lots of jobs, lots (laughs) and lots and lots of jobs. I wouldn't necessarily call them nine to five because I've never had a corporate job, but I have worked at all sorts of places, coffee shops, uh, retail stores, a car auction, a call center, like really fun stuff. Oh, wow. (laughs) So depending on the time of my life, I, um, I either had one job or two jobs, but I always had a business too. So it just kind of depended on how often I slept, depending on how many jobs I had. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. And so in 2010, like after you found like that illustration was kind of like therapeutic to whatever you were going through at that time, like how did you get from there to saying like, hmm, 
these illustrations are pretty cool or people like these illustrations, I should start selling a product. So it's interesting because in 2010, I think it was when Facebook was first really allowed to like, you didn't have to be in college to have it. And Instagram came out around that time, but it was a very different Instagram back then. (laughs) It was a post for fun Instagram, not post for business uh, Mm. Instagram. And so when I first started drawing, I was like, okay, internet, um, keep me accountable. I want to post something every single night. And then uh, it's funny because I worked in an art gallery at the time and I didn't really know if the owner liked me or not. And I worked (laughs) there for many years and I wasn't really sure. And one day, so the owner still owned the shop, but she moved to another state. And so uh, she asked to be all of our friends on Facebook, which made me nervous. (laughs) (laughs) But because I added her, she ended up calling me from North Carolina and I live in Florida uh, and I did at the time. Um, mm-hmm. she called me, she's like, Hey, I saw their stuff on Facebook and I want to sell it in the gallery. And here's all the ways you do that. Because back then there wasn't as many classes to like know what to do. And there was business books, but they're different books than there are now. There was more like for business business, not like a creative business. And so she gave me like a couple different ways to do it back then. It was the only way I knew how to do it. Uh, was to go to Office Depot and to have them print something and to buy the pre-made greeting cards at Michael's (laughs) and Office Depot paper can't be glued on that paper for some reason. So I used like scrapbooking photo corners. Like it was super, um, (laughs) in, I don't know. I want to say you went real scrappy, right? Right. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I look back, I'm like, wow, that's kind of janky work, but that's cool. Uh, and I did the best I could. Some things I still use. Like I, there is, um, like I would go, I had some artist friends. So I'm like, what do you do with these prints? And she's like, well, here's where you can buy these and these. And back then there weren't, I don't even know if Amazon was really a thing back then. But yeah. so I think I bought stuff like off eBay and I'm like, here we go. Um, and I kind of like paddled forward through there over the years. There's been a lot more classes. Like it's more talked about. You meet more artists. Instagram became more of like a community, not just like a posting your photos. You talk to other people that way and you kind of just grow like little by little. But I I think that's a good thing for people to hear because I think sometimes people think like you have to have the best paper and the most high quality prints and the this and the that. But sometimes you just got to start with what you have, you know? (laughs) Exactly. And starting and not, it takes time to figure out what you like and, and what you, there's like a big difference between what you think you're supposed to do and what is right for you. And you don't know that unless you try different ways. And I, I don't know. I'm a, little by little. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I totally get it. You just get better as you know, as you learn more skills and as you meet more people. And you're like, oh wow, you use that. Oh, I, okay. Now I'll start using them for my prints or for whatever it might be. Yeah, you don't use photo corners in Office Depot. Oh, that's right. Cool. Like, what's going like... on? Right. <laughs> So you, so I'm assuming, you know, you did what you needed to do and you get into the gallery. So then what kind of happens from there? So from there, that gave me the confidence to apply for a grant. And Mm. back then I lived in um, Orlando, Florida. And so I did, it was like tons of paperwork. It was like super overwhelming. And an art friend kind of like led me through it because she won the grant in previous years. Mm. And so I applied for this grant and I ended up getting it. And because I'm a pessimist, um, instead of being like super proud of myself for winning a grant, I was like, oh, I'm the last name. Like there was only like, there was only like three people who didn't get it. And I'm like the last person. And so I was so hard on myself instead of being like, woohoo, I won a grant. Um, (laughs) But the grant helped me. um, It was a decent amount of money and it helped me find like a printer to... Mm. Cause I thought that was the next step up is to find like a local printer to print my work. And it had me take a class at like a, an, a little, like a local little art school. And uh, I had my first art show at a cafe. I found like a cafe I loved and I started like pursuing that. And so it gave me little by little, I got confidence and then I figured out like, Oh, here's all the ways to 
potentially earn a living in this genre. For the grant, so for the artists out there that are listening, you know, maybe they didn't even consider like even like going to the local government and seeing what kind of artist grants there are. Can you just talk just a little bit about that? Like why um, that might be important and like, you know, any, any information you might have for somebody who's unfamiliar with getting grants as an artist? Of course. So depending on where you live and how like saturated by people (laughs) you live, Orlando is a lot smaller than New York. So right after I lived in Orlando, I tried to try to get other things in New York and that was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. But but basically it it's finding local if you look up like artist grants, there's everything from small little grants to where you live. There's a lot of them based on like your gender or your nationality or your race. Um, depending on where you live, there's like some interesting things you could try to pursue to get. And sometimes it's like, here's a thousand dollars. And sometimes it's very specific. Like, so on mine, it was, this is how much money you could win. And the paperwork was basically like, what would you do with that money? What's the breakdown? Where will that be spent? How are you like, what's your goal? Like, what's your, so mine was, uh, trying Mm -hmm. to like, inspire the community with encouragement. Like the the main thing I've always done in my illustration business and in my life and my brand, like my mission in life is to encourage others. So I was really big on how can I inspire the community? And I came up with a bunch of different ways and it ended up just being showing at a local cafe, inviting lots of people. And that was one way to do it. But if you Google Mm. grants, there's everything from small grants like that. And then there's really amazing like grant opportunities like a hundred thousand dollars like yeah well even like adobe residencies with residencies oh, yeah. are different than grants but they're they're in the, like the same wheelhouse and that one i've tried to win twice like and i'm sure many other people have tried to win it multiple times but that one seems like an incredible opportunity if you haven't heard about it um the adobe yeah. Yeah. That seems like a really, I um I forgot what podcast I was listening to and they interviewed somebody who was one of the past winners and it just sounded amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you basically get paid for like a year. They pay for your flights. You do lectures and they help you produce product and not as a product. It could be anything like depending on what you uh, like pitch your work. Like there's everything from graphic designers to videographers to like everything in between. So it's, pretty amazing like (laughs) yeah no I'm like I was like looking at that myself and I'm like oh my god that would be like the dream right because you get to really just truly focus on your creative project and you don't have to worry about income I know it's the dream (laughs) (laughs) and now you know and before I move on to the next thing just one more question about the grant like with like once you win it do you have to then like report back to them or they're like okay this is great here's your pot of money execute your plan good luck I'm pretty sure there was more paperwork to fill out six months after this was so long ago this was like 2011 (laughs) but there was something there was some kind of follow-up where you're like this is what I accomplished. This is what I end up spending. I think I don't mm. fully remember. And I think that really depends on the type of grant you win, but right. there's lots of interesting opportunities. I've applied for a handful of things here and there. That was like the big, yeah, yeah, that was the big one. And that's, you know, some of them are, I don't know. I, I would recommend everyone like looking in whatever's around you in your town, especially if you don't live in New York city. Uh, right. <laughs> I mean, you can still apply if you live in New York City. I applied for a lot of stuff in New York City, but <laughs> but it's so saturated with artists. I would imagine like California is the same way, right? Like you're probably against <laughs> thousands and thousands. We should of move artists. to Iowa. I know, right? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> now, now, question for you because you said kind of like right after you got like the grant. I believe you were saying something about like that's when you um, started to really figure out how to earn a living, right? From Mm -hmm. doing something you love. So what did that kind of look like your first few years? Any business where you're creating product is similar in the sense. So I was kind of still pursuing illustration the same way I was pursuing my jewelry business I had previously, which was how do you make a living? And at the time, without knowing all these other ways to make a living, I'm like, okay, you get into stores and you have them 
wholesale your work and you get into galleries and art shows and you do like art markets at like, uh, well, I guess those are called art shows too. <laughs> so art mm. shows like in a table outside with lots of vendors and then art shows like in a cafe or in a gallery or in a museum or whatnot. And that's kind of mm. how I pursued it that way. And, um, and then I discovered like licensing, like I think, Oh, so that's like a whole nother ball game. And then if you dive into that, that's broken up into like lots and lots and lots of different pieces as well of like different markets to be in. And then for a few years, I tried to push into those markets and I had like some things here and there. I had cards in target for a little while and I had cards in Trader Joe's for a little while, mm. but ultimately the artwork, what I've always had difficulty is the stuff that I love making is not necessarily like the trendy, like, mm, like that mainstream because they yeah. like those big brand stores too, big box stores. They want whatever is hot right now. Right. Like yeah, the whatever so style. Yeah. <laughs> for licensing you have, I mean, and I, not everybody, but a main portion of it is floral like florals and birthdays and Christmas and that's where like the big money makers are there's like lots of collections you have to make for and mm. it has to be very tailored to the market that you're trying to pursue and I love encouraging people and my work is not perfect in the least mm. I I like it that way <laughs> <You're> right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm like that's not perfect like that's not exactly where I fit either and I ended up um crying on my floor one day, like saying like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like all the stuff that I'm pursuing because you're supposed to is mm -hmm. not like working for me. And someone at the time was like, well, if it was working for you, would you actually be happy? Like if you were making oodles of money, would that make you happy? Like doing this particular thing? And I'm like, not at all. And so she's like, what, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to write a book. I want to encourage all the girls who are struggling that, with the, that need the encouragement I needed when I was young and I couldn't find. And mm. she's like, then do that. And I was like, okay, great. And so <laughs> in perfect scatterbrained fashion, I threw it on the internet. I'm making a book. I'm starting a Kickstarter for it. And so, which is not the way you should do Kickstarter. You shouldn't just put it up there and hope for the best. <laughs> right. But uh, it ended up getting funded. And so I wrote and illustrated a book called How Being Stubborn, Depressed, and Unpopular Saved My Life. Mm. And, and so I tried to pedal that for the few years, which I realized self-publishing is, which is what I did is very difficult because a lot of bookstores are like, we can't take a self-published book. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> so yeah, it gets tricky. Like I just self-published a book this year too. I went through Ingram Sparks. Wh who did you decide to go through for your, your, your book? So I ended up creating it on create space. Oh yeah. And then, Amazon. Mm-hmm. So I looked at In Ingram's a distributor, isn't it? Or yeah, so Ingram is a distributor, and then their the self published version of them is Ingram Sparks. Okay, yeah, I remember looking yeah. them up too. And my husband helped me do all this research because ultimately, I really wanted to find like a small person to do it, but you mm. still had to order thousands. And right. so, <laughs> and since I had like, and I lived in a very tiny apartment in New York. So even ordering 200 books filled up like our whole living room. And there's these <laughs> funny pictures. I just gave a talk at a writer's group, like a women's writer's group. And I showed all these pictures of like me and my husband surrounded by boxes of books, like in our tiny right. New York apartment. <laughs> and so I think I ended up having maybe 86 backers or something. And so we packaged all those books up and we sent them on their way. And I would try to get a publisher over the next few years. And eventually I did. Uh, so mm. I have another book coming out in 2019. Uh, it's very different than my book I wrote, mm. but I'm still hoping it helps girls. <laughs> yeah, I I am positive it will. And then that's interesting too, because, and I've heard stories like that too. Um, so how were you, how do you think you were able to finally like get a publisher to pick it up? Was it because of the book sale or, you know, publicity or, you know, what do you think it is that you did that made them say like, oh, we're, you know, we want to have Jennifer like create a book for us? Well, this day and age is really hard. So unless mm -hmm. you have like a mega following online, you probably can't just pitch publishers. A lot of them won't even take solicited pitches. 
I did get lots of wonderful rejections from the ones who said no. Um, (laughs) But but basically, I ended up finding an agent. I messaged quite a few of them. And finally, one said yes. And then you have to do it the traditional way, like creating like a a proper pitch to the publishers. And you end up sending it to lots and lots of publishers. And you're lucky if, if one or maybe even two say, yes, I want to pick this up. And that's like a whole Mm. other ball game. But um, but the uh, one picked it up though. So that's really did. cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so my book is being published by a branch of Penguin Random House called Crown. And mm. uh, it's taken a very long time. <laughs> I signed the contract <laughs> in 2016 and the book will be out in 2019. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. But I've heard that too. So it, it's kind of like a waiting game, right? A little bit. Yeah. It's hard because it's not like the book was, the book is still, it's, it's still being edited now. So it is a long process of, and there's a lot of people and a lot of hands it has to go through. And it's, it's very different than self-publishing. There's definitely pros and cons to both of them. I mean, look, we both created books, maybe not easily, but a lot more easily than in the traditional publishy way. Um, Right. Yeah. That's what I was telling people too. Like I don't have a following where I think anyone is going to be like, Nishé, we want to pick you up. But, but, (laughs) uh, listening to some podcasts that like just talked about it, like a couple of folks I listened to had like cookbooks and so forth, but, um, you lose a little bit of control, right. When you go with a traditional publisher, whereas the self-publishing, as soon as we were done, you know, you went to Create Space, I went to Ingram Spark, but we just uploaded a file and we're like, okay, people, this is for sale. You know, mm-hmm. um, there's not it's like so a lot different. of admin. Yeah. <laughs> it really is overseen by so many people. It's so much more difficult in all these different ways that self-publishing yeah. isn't. And that's not necessarily bad or good. It's just different. Yeah. Now for your first book, um, you know, going the self-publishing route, did you have any tips for people out there who are like, you know, that's probably my best route, you know, is to go self-publish, the self-publishing route? So the best, uh, okay, so here's one that if people aren't necessarily like me or my brain, and especially because mine is fully illustrated. So it's at the first one was 66 fully illustrated pages. And I'm Mm. kind of, I, we keep using the same word, but I guess I'm kind of a scrappy artist. So I do what I know the best I can. And I'm sure there's other better ways, but I'm more of like a, I want to do this right now person. And so (laughs) I'm, I'm like, I'll just lay everything out in Photoshop. And so I came up with like a few pages and I would like kind of in a collage type manner, like stick the text I want to put and the people and like the illustrations and the doodles all around it and do what I want. And so I created like a good chunk of the book that way before really realizing, oh, I don't want a book that's eight by 10. Like, <laughs> uh, the size. I'm like yeah. why in the world would you not think about that before you make a book? <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't even occur to me. Like that wasn't even a question in my brain. It was just like, I opened up a file and then I, you know, made more files. Like <laughs> Just start it. So no, that's some good right, advice. <laughs> start at the right size. Um, with an all textbook, obviously that won't happen to you. But if there are illustrations in there, that could potentially be hard. And uh, definitely have people read stuff along the way because you might think you're onto something and people might not know. Like it might not jive with them the same way. Or there might be, I remember when I pitched one particular agent who said, maybe, with my first book, she was like, all right, I got to like the, the third. So what happens is like, someone's like, okay, maybe. And then they have to bring it to, I think like either their team. And then after their team, it goes through another team. And after that, it goes through like a marketing type group team. Mm. And which is primarily often men. And mm, so yeah. they were like, well, we don't need a book like this. Like, why would why would girls need a book like this? We already have books like this, which I disagree with. And right. so, but she was able to tell me, like, if we did pick up your book after this last meeting, here's like where things are missing. Like this story right here, since my book is is like my story, it's an encouraging book using my story to help people not feel alone. Like, if I could help other people not have to go through what I've gone through by like humorously mm. telling you a, like a raw story, then that's, 
I'm doing my job. And so she's like, you went from like this age to this age, like what about the middle? And you talk about like the hard parts of dating here, but then you talk about being married. Like there's no like middle. And so I ended up republishing my book in 2015. So I, the Kickstarter ran in 2012 and in 2013, I published the book and then sent it out to all of my Kickstarter backers. And then in 2015, I changed the cover and I added 30 more pages and I implemented everything that she recommended to me because whoever I ended up trying to pitch my book to again, obviously those were factors in a traditional publishing. Like she was right. Mm, Like all those things needed to be addressed. And so I republished it in 2015. Now, have you found, because I think this would be really good, because even like since I I literally just self-published my book like a couple months ago, like really maybe a month and a half ago. And so I've gotten tons of questions about how to do it. So I know like all of this stuff you're saying is gold, right? Because people are trying to figure out like the best way to do it and the questions they should ask. One thing that I can't answer for them, and um, maybe you have some insight on it, is since you've had uh, at least a self-published book out for a couple of years, you know, it was it bringing in just like a little slice of your income, half of your income, majority of your income? Because I've heard like it just really depends on how it's published, how much the book is, but a lot of times you're not necessarily making a ton of money from it, but it allows you to get other opportunities because people see you as a a published author. So I'm just curious what your experience has been. And you totally nailed on the head. Like sometimes like books don't necessarily bring you money. They bring you potential opportunity or credibility in a sense. And even in the traditional publishing sense, it's talked about that once you receive like the the payment from the publisher, you probably won't see anything else. <laughs> like, mm, right, right. <laughs> unless, unless you sell thousands and thousands and thousands in your pop, like I don't, I hate the word popular, but like well known, <laughs> then you right. probably don't see any more money. You can hope for opportunity, and so the same kind of thing. It's hard, especially my book is all color, and to get the the cost to print a ninety page full color book is really high. And so yeah. even getting into stores was impossible because if the book cost me X, like my book I, I know is already on the higher side for the book that it is, but I can't charge any less because it cost me so much to make it. And right. that's the hard part about self-publishing, at least in America, if, unless you wanted to order thousands of them, which you can right. still do in America, it's very difficult. I mean, for a textbook, it might be a little easier because I'm sure, I'm not sure if yours is all text. But the profit margin is probably a lot higher, but it's all about marketing. And so it just depends on the book and the people you know and how hard you push it. Uh, No, I completely agree. (laughs) It's just hard. All of this is hard. Owning a business is hard. Like, (laughs) it just is. (laughs) Like, <laughs> well, that's why I tell people like I, you know, cause I'm like, Hey, my book is a little bit pricier, you know, kind of look at it as like a workbook because it does have some images in it, color in it. And then I, I went with Ingram versus Crate Space because I wanted at least the first edition to be hard cover. And mm-hmm. so I'm like getting a hard cover book with premium pages. It's like the cost of that for them to just print it, you know, on demand is like, crazy expensive and then by the time you have to consider like what the wholesale price is you really do have to mark up the book pretty high so Mm -hmm. if a company does come or a bookstore buys your stuff wholesale that you're not in the hole for that book like so there's like people don't realize like there's all these different factors that you have to consider yeah no absolutely (laughs) with any product you do there's like certain not mathematics but there's like little things you have to consider in order to get like the, the cost of X, like what would X be for you in order to actually not lose money. And for me with my book, since the cost is so high, I had to decide, all right, do I want the book out there and make no money? Basically? Like I was making a quarter. If I wholesaled my book at stores, I was making a quarter. Like it's ridiculous. And so, and even if you use something like create space, and your book sells, say your book sells for $35, you might still only see like four bucks of that. It's very difficult. Yeah. Like they only, they don't pay you that much, even if your book is is selling for more. And even if the cost, so say your cost of your book retail was 35 on Amazon 
and mm -hmm. but it only costs you seven dollars to make it amazon's still not giving you that whole seven dollars they're only giving you like a piece of that like <laughs> right because they're gonna take 50 percent of whatever that the mandatory wholesale price is right yeah, yeah. so it's just yeah. hard <laughs> i know no i i'm feeling the, i feel the pain too because I, I was telling people i'm yeah. like you know, it's the books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble or whatever, because Ingram Spark will like distribute it to those places. But I'm like, really, if you want to support me, just purchase it from my site, because then that way I don't have to give those companies a cut. Like I have it on there just to show people like I'm it's established and it, it gives it like a little bit more weight. But I'm like, in order for me to truly make a profit, you know, I need people to buy directly from me, even no, though that exactly. could be such a pain a little bit too, right? Because then you have to ship everything versus Barnes and Noble or whoever shipping it, right? So there's always a catch. Yeah. So there's, again, pros and cons to that. And a lot of people will, if you, well, since I do like art shows where you go out and you stand there for hours and people like meet you and everyone's like, is it on Amazon? And it is, but buy it for me right here. Like it's at the table. Like don't buy it later. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I, and it's funny because I think people just don't get it. They're just thinking like, Ooh, it's probably cheaper on Amazon. Plus, you know, I have prime or whatever it might be, but it's like, if you really want to support like local artists or business people, it's like buy directly from them. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. All this publishing stuff, golden. Um, <laughs> so as we wrap up here, um, my question for you, okay. So now in your business, uh, you've got like a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, and I think that goes into like diversifying your income. So I, I don't, I'm not sure if you still do it now, but you talked a little bit about licensing I know that I've seen, I believe on your Instagram that um, you've done a creative live before. So like talk courses, you know, you've talked about being a vendor at craft fairs or markets and things like that. So I'm just curious, like for the listeners out there, can you maybe just um, kind of walk through some of the different ways you have figured out how to diversify your income to give them an idea of like, you know, like things they need to consider if they're like an artist like yourself? So if they are, an, I mean, an artist in general, like all the things you talked about, so you could wholesale your work, which is selling it to stores generally for 50% less. So whatever your retail cost is, is generally 50% less than that as wholesale, depending on the store. There's also something called consignment, which if you're just starting off would work, which is they don't pay you right wholesale. They pay you straight up. Like if they're buying a hundred cards, they're paying for a hundred cards and then off they go and you hope they reorder and, then you <laughs> right. um, and you harass them until they hopefully reorder. And, uh, well, continuously coming up with new products. That's always been the hardest part for me is since my, my end goal was not to create birthday cards and all like, I had trouble growing as a product person because in order to succeed in the wholesale genre of like prints and cards is coming up with new collections all the time. And the collections would have to include specific things, birthdays, mm -hmm. holidays, love, like, which are not my favorite things to make. So that hurt me as a business, but that's so that's just me though. So then there's consigning your work and then there's licensing your work, which is pretty much a company paying for an image uh, to use on different product and making sure they pay you the right amount. So mm. like, <laughs> we don't need people in like taking advantage of other people. Like people, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand why an art industry is the only real one who's like, it should be for free. Like, right. like <laughs> it should be, no one goes to a doctor and says, you love being a doctor. Like, you know, have me as a client, right? Can't, I can't right. Like, can't you give me a 50% like, discount? Can't I, you? I exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and no one even goes to like Macy's and says like, this shirt's nice, but I want it for $10. Like that doesn't happen <laughs> except to like people who have their own businesses, a lot of creatives. So a lot of licensing companies either end up stealing or mm. cheaping people out. And so if you are going the licensing route, really do your research and figure out what you should be paid for things because it ends up hurting the rest of us. If someone's like, if I'm using Target as an example, but like if Target's like, oh, well, 
Jennifer did it for a hundred dollars. So we're just going to only offer people a hundred dollars. Obviously we could find people who would do it for a hundred dollars when it should be like $10,000 or a thousand dollars. Like, and so yeah. if you do go that route, make sure you don't get taken advantage of. Cause also things take way longer than you think they're going to take always. Mm. And when people are paying you less, they tend to also have a lot more opinions. And so people want to pay you 200 bucks and then tell you, Oh, I don't want that after all redo it. And mm. that's not, how that works. Yeah. Uh, also, always make sure there's a contract. Like, <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> so make sure you get paid. Uh, and then other ways to be like an artist. Uh, there's art shows. There's, I mean, you have to do a lot of different stuff because some income, no matter what business you have, it fluctuates up and down. And so even if you're a writer, you have to think of lots of different ways to bring in income because things can especially in the product industry, like it's seasonal. So like you might have, you might make $20,000 in February for Valentine's day, but you might not make any money for the rest of the summer. And I know like for coaching, like mm. they don't make any money around the hot, like the holiday time, unless you're hoping people buy for the holidays that they can use it for next year. Like mm. the better you hire a coach type thing, but there's like, everything is seasonal. Like there's always, depending on your business, it's always like, you might not see money for a little while. Like, yeah. <laughs> what else can you do? <laughs> no, those are all like great things. And, you know, I mean, I think that just kind of shows people too, like there's just not this one way. So just, they need to just keep experiment, experimenting with different things. Mm -hmm. And then just lastly too, before I get to like kind of the, the wrap up questions, just for the listeners out there, can you just talk, I mean, you've talked a little bit about it, but like your illustrations are all about like encouraging others. Like I see on Instagram, you know, you have something that's like, we're all in this together. You know, we need change, you know, I mean, like it's all about encouragement. So I'm just curious, like what made you decide like, okay, this is what my illustrations are going to be about. And then no matter what I do or no matter what direction I go into, like, this is kind of like your, like your thing, right? It's like helping others. I don't know if I really chose that. I mean, okay. <laughs> it just, it just kind of who I am. Like I need to help other people and <laughs> this is just the route that I chose to do it in. I mean, it's basically a lot of my work is what I need to hear. And so I figure other people need to hear it as well. And so I share it. I really want people to know like they're not alone if they're struggling. And like, that's literally why I'm starting a podcast is because, so I don't know if you know, but I, you might know because in the, the Facebook group we met in, but I am seven months pregnant or maybe seven and a half months pregnant. And so since mm. I became pregnant, I have no desire to draw anymore or really do anything. And I'm like, how else can I encourage other people? I'm like, all right, I'm going to start a podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it's basically like a, I'm like, all right, how can I still keep my mission going? It's just something I need to do. Like there's like things you feel like you should be doing, how you're going to make a living. And there's things you feel like you just need to do, even if the money isn't there right away. And it's just in me. I have to encourage others. So I'm like, all right, I'll start a podcast for creative people that are dealing with mental wellness or mental illness or, you know, just need some encouragement. So <laughs> finding no, what like super it. passionate about and then figuring out what you can do with that is how you won't want to give up on a business because business is hard. Like so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I, I totally get what you're saying. So just a couple of wrap up questions. The first one is, you know, I, I, you know, used to ask people, how have you discovered your passion? And usually people are like, of course, it's what I'm doing. So I've <laughs> switched up that question to what is the best resource you've found to help you with your business? So I'm going a different route, maybe than other people who might go. I don't know. <laughs> but community? Like, mm. because in order to run a business, there's lots of up and downs. And it's funny because when you're, I mean, I'm in my 30s, so there was no internet when I was growing up. But it, a lot of people, there's actually like podcasts about how like, it's so easy to find friends when you're little, but it's so hard when you're older. Right. And I think it's the opposite. Like I did not have any friends growing up, but now that the internet existed, I found all these people just like me. And mm. so most of my friends, my best 
closest people I talk to every day, I've never even met in real life. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. I've met once, at, like after years of knowing them. And so my favorite resource is finding, like Instagram is a great resource to help you find a community of people just like you that could potentially end up being really good friends or people to lean on or people who understand you. And it might not mm-hmm. be Instagram for you, depending on what your business is, but finding people who can relate and they don't have to do exactly what you're doing. I, all my friends aren't illustrators. A lot of them do lots of different stuff, but life is hard and you need people to talk to. And even if it's just one person or two people, whether you know them from the internet or not, mm-hmm. uh, that's how I stay sane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, community is important. You need, you need people that you can relate to, that you can vent to, that you can talk to. So I think, you know, in order to be successful, you have to have some, some type of community. I think people think it has to be a big community, but I'm like, no, like you can have a small circle, but as long as you have a circle of people that are, are there for you, no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what's one thing that you can, you cannot live without? It could be anything, tech, makeup, furniture, a person, anything. <laughs> my husband. <Right. laughs> I t- it took my husband and I seven years of being best friends to date. And uh, he's mine now forever. And I get oh, to keep nice. him. <laughs> <laughs> and now you guys are about to have like a little mini you. <laughs> I know. We're having a little mini him. It's so weird. <laughs> Very cool. And then please just tell the listeners like, you know, any social media handles, your website, your podcast, anything you want them to know about. Sure. And so my website is jenniferlin.com. I spell my name kind of weird. It's J-E-N-I-P-H-E-R, Lynn, L-Y-N.com. And then from there, my handle on everything is pretty much the same thing as at Jennifer Lynn. My podcast is jenniferlin.com slash podcast. And it's called Rainy Day Diaries, and it comes out on April 2nd, and I'm so excited. (laughs) (laughs) Well, very cool. Thank you for agreeing to be on the podcast. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Just, I just want to pull out a couple of quick things. One, you must diversify your income. I think no matter what guests I bring on, if they're an entrepreneur, a small business owner, or even if they're doing something as a side hustle, diversifying your income is a must and figuring out the best way to do that. Second, just do whatever you really want to do. Do not be afraid and don't wait until you feel everything is perfect because nothing will ever be perfect. And I think her story just shows that. Like She just was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this book. She did the book. She did a Kickstarter and everything worked out. And everything doesn't always work out, but that's okay too. Because when things don't work out for me, I just pivot. It's not the end of the world. I still have my life. So you know what I'm saying? Like I still can move on, learn from whatever has happened, and then go from there. So don't be afraid to really do what you want to do. And then lastly... She mentions a story about how her friend, like right before she published a book, like was asking her, you know, what is it that you really want to do and what will make you happy? And that's what like led her to the book. And that just reminded me of the reason why I created my journal is because we never take the time to ask ourselves those questions like, what will make me happy? Like, what in my life doesn't make me happy? What can I change about that? And then what can I do like moving forward? So I challenge you to really just take the time and ask yourself some of those questions. It's just all about self-discovery. And when you do, if you're really honest with yourself, then I think you will figure out like, what you should do moving forward. And it's a journey, right? Sometimes you have to experiment with multiple things before really figuring out what it is you want to do. But you have to start with asking yourself those questions. So anyway, let me know your thoughts. Leave a comment on the article, nashaysnow.com slash 53. Leave a comment on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Just let us know if you like the episode. I'd, I'd really love to hear your thoughts. And I hope the book publishing thing was interesting to you guys too. If you all ever have any questions for me, you know, you could just shoot me a line at hello at nashaysnow.com or hit me up on social media. 
All right. Like I mentioned earlier, if you can, please share this episode with anyone you think it will resonate with. And if you get a chance, please rate me five stars on iTunes. I will love you forever. All right. Have an amazing day and an an amazing night. And I will talk to you guys next week. Take care. Bye.